Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this briefing on the Pew Research Center's 2020 survey of Jewish Americans. I'm Mark Wilf, and I'm privileged to be the chair of the board of the Jewish Federations of North America. This has been a tough year, and I know many of you have been on the front lines of sustaining vibrant Jewish life across the United States and around the globe. I want you to know that your work is deeply appreciated. Thank you. Thousands of people registered for this call. It's clear that we Jewish Americans are very interested in finding out more about ourselves. To all of you who made the time to join us, thank you on behalf of JFNA for the work you do every single day to power our Jewish community. I also wanna thank the Pew Research Center for engaging in this important project and for inviting JFNA to co-sponsor this briefing. The reason so many of us are on this call is that we know that Pew studies provide useful information. For the past eight years, insights we learned from the 2013 report, The Portrait of Jewish Americans, have helped to shape the Federation system's work. And now, all of us are eager to find out what the new report will reveal about Jewish American life today. Hi everyone, I'm Alan Cooperman. I'm Director of Religion Research at the Pew Research Center in Washington, DC. Thank you, Mark Wilf, and thank you, JFNA, for co-hosting this online event. I'm feeling very lucky and grateful to have largely weathered this pandemic and now to be able to release the results of a massive survey that we've been working on for close to three years. As many of you know, the Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, non advocacy research center. We study religion because we think it's important, not because we are trying to promote any particular religion or religion in general. We don't take policy positions and we don't make recommendations, which is why this event will conclude today with an independent panel of Jewish leaders who are free to talk about what they see as the implications of this study for Jewish organizations and communities across the country. And I'm very eager to hear what they think. Pew Research Center does not have any clients. We don't have any advertisers. We don't sell anything to anybody. Our funding comes primarily from our parent organization, the Pew Charitable Trusts, sometimes for very costly and complex projects, we seek additional funding from organizations or individuals. In the case of the 2020 Survey of Jewish Americans, the funding came from the same two sources as our 2013 study, the Pew Charitable Trust and the Neubauer Family Foundation. So I want to take this moment in particular to thank Joe and Jeanette Neubauer for their generous, encouraging, and patient support. Joe and Jeanette, I know you're out there somewhere, and I hope you will now take a virtual bow. Just a couple of housekeeping items. This event is being taped, and if you have to walk away, though that would be wrong, you can watch the remainder of it on this very page that you are looking at right now on your browser. Uh, also, you can submit questions about the survey or for the panelists at any time. Just use the chat button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Now, we had a very large team working on this survey, but the brains, heart, and soul of that team for the past year has been my wonderful colleague, Becca Alper, who will now walk you through some of the findings. Becca, over to you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled so many of you are joining us today to hear about the center's latest survey of Jewish Americans. My colleagues and I have worked on this project for a few years, and I have very much been looking forward to this moment. So let's get started. First slide, please. Alan, uh, go back a slide, please. 
So Alan already told you a little bit about this, uh, who we are. You can learn more about the center's mission on our website, pewresearch.org. Let's move on. Let me give you a brief overview over what we'll cover today. In our new survey of Jewish Americans, we find some elements of stability. The share of the U.S. population that identifies as Jewish, for example, has remained stable. The same is true for the religious composition of the Jewish population. We see that the share of Jewish adults who identify as Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, or who do not identify with any particular stream is on par with our last survey of Jewish Americans, which we conducted in 2013. And the overall intermarriage rate is also stable. Next slide. At the same time, the new survey picks up on some elements of change. We see newfound concerns about anti-Semitism, and we see evidence of growth at either ends of the religious spectrum. We call it religious divergence, and Alan will get into that a little bit more later. As is true of the American public overall, we find evidence of political polarization among Jewish Americans. Orthodox Jews are as, are as solidly Republican as non-Orthodox Jews are solidly Democratic. The new survey also finds that American Jews are becoming more racially and ethnically diverse, similar to what we see among U.S. adults overall. Next slide. There are also several things we remain uncertain about. One source of uncertainty is that we did the survey differently than in 2013, and I'll get into those details in just a minute. There is also uncertainty in the political change we're seeing. The 2013 survey happened during Obama's presidency, the current survey was fielded during Trump's presidency, and we're now at the start of Biden's term. We don't know how attitudes and opinions may have shifted. And lastly, the coronavirus pandemic. The survey was designed before there was any hint of a possible pandemic. The survey was planned, and, and most of the responses had already been gathered before the U.S. outbreak escalated last year. Next slide. The survey was conducted online and by mail using an ABS or address-based sample drawn from the U U.S. Postal Service's National List of Residential Addresses, which included addresses from all 50 states and the District of Columbia. We did it this way because it's now the best way to do a nationally representative survey due to declining response rates to phone surveys. We got a much higher response rate by recruiting respondents by mail and asking them to take the survey online and on paper than we would have if we had done it again by phone as we did in 2013. The report largely focuses on 4,718 U.S. adults who identify as Jewish. About 3,800 are Jews by religion, people who say their religion is Jewish and do not profess any other religion, and nearly 900 respondents who are Jews of no religion, people who describe themselves religiously as atheists, agnostic or nothing in particular, but who have a Jewish parent or were raised Jewish and who still consider themselves Jewish in some way, such as ethnically, culturally, or because of their family background. To examine the impact of switching from a phone survey in 2013 to an online and mail survey in 2020, we conducted an experiment with a separate group of nearly 2,300 Jewish respondents. None of the experiment's participants are counted as respondents in the main survey. We randomly assigned some to be interviewed by phone and others to answer the same questions online or by mail. We used this experiment to help us determine whether the results of the new study can be compared to the results of the 2013 study. The result of this experiment was as disappointing to us as I'm sure it is to you. We, we generally have to advise against comparing specific percentage points estimates from the 2013 and 2020 surveys and assuming that any differences represent real change. The mode switch just has too, met, too much of an impact on the way respondents answer survey questions to permit many direct comparisons. There are, however, a few exceptions, which we note in our report, and we'll talk about some of them next. Next slide. Among some of the questions we can compare to the 2013 study, we see some sense of stability among American Jews. Next slide. We see that the Jewish population is fairly stable in percentage terms, keeping pace with the U.S. population overall, but is rising in absolute numbers. In 2013, about 2% 2 of the U.S. adult population identified as Jewish, and the current survey finds a similar share. The share of Jews who identify as Orthodox, 
conservative reform or another branch of Judaism like Reconstructionist movement or humanist Judaism or who do not affiliate with a particular branch of uh, Judaism remains similar. And that stability extends to in intermarriage as well. Overall intermarriage rates look pretty similar as you can see over here on the chart on the right. Next slide. As you can see here, intermarriage has been on the rise over the long term. Among Jews who got married before 1980, about one in five married a non-Jewish spouse. That rate grew to about four in 10 for Jews who got married in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. The intermarriage rate for the most recent decade stands at 61%. You might remember that we found a similar intermarriage rate in our 2013 study, suggesting that the share of Jewish Americans who marry a non-Jewish spouse it's not changed much since we last conducted this survey. It is important to point out that intermarriage rates are different for non-Orthodox Jews, as you will see on the next slide. Next slide. Perhaps not unexpectedly, intermarriage is higher among non-Orthodox Jews than it is among Jews overall. This is in part because nearly all Orthodox Jews who are married have a Jewish spouse. And if we look just at those who got married during the last decade, among the non-Orthodox, 72% are intermarried. And again, that number is the same share we found in 2013 among those who got married in the decade just before that study was connect conducted. So to say differently, even though intermarriage appears to have risen in the long term, we have no evidence that it's risen from 2013 to 2020. Next slide. The 2020 survey asked Jewish Americans about what being Jewish means to them. We offered respondents a list of attributes and activities that they could classify as essential, important but not essential, or not important to what being Jewish means to them. While we can't make direct comparisons to the 2013 study due to differences in the way the survey was conducted and the addition of one item to the list, we see that the broad pattern of responses is similar in many ways. Now, if you're curious, the item about continuing family traditions is the new one. Half of Jewish Americans say this is an essential part of their Jewish identity. As you can see, more Jewish Americans say that remembering the Holocaust is an essential part of their identity than any other item on the list we offered. And majority say leading a moral life, a moral and ethical life, and working for justice and equality in society is essential. In 2013, we saw the same top three responses. Next slide. What that last slide showed us and the survey makes clear is that being Jewish is not just about religion and there's no one way that American Jews think about being Jewish. When asked whether being Jewish is mainly a matter of religion, ancestry, or culture, some Jewish respondents pick each of these things and many choose some combination of them. And in fact, among the most common answers is that being Jewish is about religion, ancestry, and culture. Note, however, that twice as many Jewish Americans say that being Jewish is mainly about ancestry or culture as they say about religion. Let's take a closer look at the role religion plays in the lives of Jewish Americans on the next slide. Similar to what we found in 2013, generally speaking, Jews are far less religious than American adults as a whole. For example, one in five Jews say religion is very important in their lives compared with four in 10 U.S. adults overall. And about one in 10 Jews say they attend synagogue at least weekly, while about a quarter of, U sorry, a quarter of U.S. adults say they attend religious services as often. We see even bigger gaps when it comes to belief in God. A majority of U.S. adults say they believe in God as described in the Bible compared with a quarter of Jews. Next slide. Consistent with this pattern, compared with U.S. adults overall, fewer Jews say their religious faith provides them with a great deal of meaning and fulfillment. It's a short bar at the bottom of this chart. But for non-religious activities, such as spending time with family, spending time with pets, being outdoors, Jews look a lot more like the U.S. population overall when it comes to what provides them with meaning and fulfillment. That's all for me. I'm now going to turn it over to Alan, who's going to discuss some signs of change that we've picked up on in our current survey. But I ask that you as audience go easy on him. He hasn't done many presentations about American Jews before. Thank you, Becca. Next slide, please. 
You know, uh, it's sobering to remember that back in 2012, when we were designing the first Pew study of Jewish Americans, our expert panel advisors unanimously told us that anti-Semitism, in their view, was not a pressing concern of Jewish Americans at that time. And so we went pretty light on that topic in the 2013 study. This time around, uh, in the wake of events in Charlottesville and the shootings at synagogues in Pittsburgh and Poway, California, we asked many more questions about anti-Semitism. Next slide, please. To begin with, we find that three quarters of Jewish Americans say there's more anti-Semitism today than there was five years ago. Most of the rest say it's about the same and very few, just 5%, say there's less anti-Semitism now in the United States than there was five years ago. We also see in the lower bar that more than half of the people we surveyed, the Jews we surveyed, said that as a Jewish person in the United States, they personally feel less safe today than they did five years ago. And most of the remainder say there's not been much change. Trust 3% of Jewish Americans say they feel more safe than they did five years before the survey. Next slide, please. We followed that question with a, with a follow-up that was intended to try to measure the chilling effect that anti-Semitism could be having on Jewish observances and activities in the United States. So among the people who told us that they feel less safe, we then asked them, have you hesitated to participate in events because you feel less safe? Uh, or have you hesitated but gone ahead and participated anyway? Or did you not in the end participate? And these figures that you're seeing on this slide are based on all American Jews. 35% of all American Jews say they feel less safe, but they have not hesitated to participate in Jewish events. 12% say they feel less safe. They have hesitated, but they went ahead and participated anyway. And 5% of Jewish Americans say that they feel less safe, they have hesitated, and in fact, they did not participate in an observance or an event out of security concerns. Next slide, please. We also asked about experiences with a set of specific kinds of anti-Semitic um, experiences, ranging in severity from having seen anti-Jewish graffiti or vandalism in your neighborhood to having been physically threatened or attacked. And I'll give you a moment just to digest these numbers for yourselves, but I'll also point out one important pattern, which is that Orthodox Jews are more likely to say, more likely than Jews as a whole, to say that they have experienced some of these anti-Semitic uh, incidents, such as being made to feel unwelcome or being called offensive names or seeing graffiti in their neighborhoods. And there's a related pattern we also see in the survey, which is that people who tell us that they wear some distinctively Jewish item uh, of apparel, uh, such as a kippah or a head covering, are also more likely to say that they have experienced uh, a number of these uh, types of events. Next slide, please. We also asked for the first time about a series of anti-Semitic stereotypes, uh, but we took care to try to differentiate between people who say that they've heard these things firsthand in their presence versus those who may have read or heard about them on social media or in mainstream media. We find that 30% of American Jews say that in the past year, they've heard in their presence, someone say that Jews care too much about money. 9% say they've heard someone say that the Holocaust did not happen or is exaggerated. And 6% say they've heard the dual loyalty accusation, that is that Jews care more about Israel than about the United States. And altogether, fully a third of Jewish Americans, you see in the final column, say they've heard at least one of these three uh, tropes or stereotypes in the past year. Next slide. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about what Becca called religious divergence, by which we mean the growth 
at both ends of the spectrum of traditionalism or religious behavior, particularly among younger Jewish uh, adults. Fully 17% of Jewish adults under 30 are Orthodox, and most of them are Haredi. Next slide. Meanwhile, the share who identify with the conservative and reform movements is declining by age cohort. Next slide. While the share who identify with no particular branch of Judaism is growing, it's now 41% in that youngest age group, and the share who identify with other branches, such as reconstructing Judaism or uh, 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 a variety of humanistic Judaism, et cetera, is pretty stable. Now, what you're looking at here, uh, these figures represent both Jews by religion and Jews of no religion. Indeed, some Jews of no religion do identify with some branches or streams of American Judaism. Next slide. So let me dwell just for a moment um, on these definitions again. Jews by religion are people who, when asked what their religion is, very simply say they're Jewish. It doesn't matter what their level of observance is. If someone tells us that their religion is Judaism, we count them as a Jew by religion. Next slide. Jews of no religion are uh, people who tell us in answer to that same question, what is your present religion, if any, that they're atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, uh, but who tell us that they have a Jewish parent or were raised Jewish, and they still consider themselves Jewish in some way, such as ethnically, culturally, or by family background. Now you may wonder, why, why, are, why are Becca and Alan belaboring this distinction, this distinction so much? And it, it's because it really comes out of the heart of this survey. And to a certain extent, it's the answer to the question at what you might think of as the Pewish Seder, the first of the four questions at a Pewish Seder. Why is this religion survey different from all other religion surveys? And the reason is that in this survey, it's not only religion that counts. Being Jewish is a matter not just of religion, but of peoplehood. When you think about Presbyterians or Methodists, Presbyterians or Methodists can't be Presbyterian or Methodists aside from religion. It makes no sense. But for Jews, it does make sense to try to capture people in this survey who think of themselves as culturally or ethnically or by family background as Jewish, even if they don't associate with the Jewish religion. And that's what the Jews of no religion category is doing. Next slide, please. The other reason, though, that we pay particular attention to this is that it is a powerful distinction. We simply see it, it jumps out of the numbers in the survey. Not only are Jews of no religion on the whole less religious, as you might expect, but on the whole, they're also less connected to Jewish life in quite a few ways. They're less likely to have been to Israel. They're less likely to say that being Jewish is important to them. They're less likely to feel a sense of responsibility to help fellow Jews in need around the world. They're much less likely to have donated to a Jewish charity or cause in the past year. Next slide. So we asked ourselves, well, what if any ways, first of all, why, why don't many Jews, including many Jews of religion, participate in organized Jewish life? And what, if anything, do they do? So there's two new batteries of questions in the 2020 survey that we didn't ask in 2013. One of them asks people who go to synagogue on a monthly basis or more why they go to synagogue. And we gave them several possible reasons. And the other asks why people who do not attend synagogue on a monthly basis or more, why they, those who rarely go to synagogue, why they don't go more often. And we tested some of the common uh, hypotheses, theories that you may have heard, things like it costs too much, uh, or I don't feel welcome. And actually those are not among the, uh, the, the, the top reasons that people give. The top reasons that people give us for why they do go to synagogue are because I find it spiritually meaningful, I feel a sense of belonging there when I want to be connected to my ancestry or history. And among the top reasons that people tell us they don't go to synagogue are, I'm not religious, 
I'm just not interested, and I express my Jewishness in other ways. Let me repeat that last one, I express my Jewishness in other ways. Well, we thought, what are some of those other ways? So another new battery, next slide, in the 2020 survey. Ask people about a variety of what you might think of as do-it-yourself religious observances or cultural or ethnic ways of being Jewish. And we found that a very large share of American Jews do do some of these things. In fact, many of these things. For example, uh, a majority say they often or sometimes cook or eat traditional Jewish foods or visit synagogues or Jewish sites when traveling. Uh, down lower on the list, you'll see about a quarter of American Jews say they go to Jewish film festivals or seek out Jewish films, and about 16% say they participate in activities or services with Chabad. Next slide. Now, Jews by religion do all of these things, participate in all of the activities we asked about at higher rates than Jews of no religion. But it's important to note that substantial numbers of Jews of no religion do say they engage in some of these activities. Next slide. Also, interestingly, uh, I, 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 this was something I might not have predicted. Younger Jews participate in these cultural activities roughly at the same rates as older Jews. Uh, with one exception in particular, you may note in the middle of this slide, that watching TV with Jewish or Israeli themes seems to be really kind of an older person thing. Now, if you're thinking, ouch, I'm right there with you, but if the younger folks are not watching Stiesel or Fauda during the pandemic, that's their loss. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to move a little bit to political polarization. Um, as Becca noted, Jews overall lean strongly democratic and by a margin of a roughly three to one, very similar to, to what we've seen for decades now among American Jews. But the Orthodox population, which in the 2013 study was just barely uh, a majority Republican or Republican leaning, 57% in 2013, is now as solidly Republican as Jews as a whole are Democratic. Next slide. And in terms of self-described um, political ideology, Jews as a whole lean liberal, 50% describe themselves as liberals and 80-some and, and percent describe themselves as liberal or moderate. But among Orthodox Jews, a solid 60% describe themselves as conservative. Also, to confuse the non-Jewish population, I'll just note that only about a quarter of conservative Jews in the United States describe themselves as politically conservative. Next slide. And now on to racial and ethnic uh, uh, identification. In 2013, 94% of Jewish Americans identified as white and non-Hispanic. In the 2020 study, it's 92%. In 2020, we had about 4% to identify as Hispanic, 1% as Black, roughly 3% as, as other races, that includes Asian, or as multiracial, and a total in all of the categories other than white, non-Hispanic, of about 8% of the Jewish population. When we look at that by age, we see again a very striking pattern. Younger Jews, much more diverse, ethnically and culture and, and uh, racially than older Jews. Fully 15% of younger Jews identify with those categories, and so including 7% who identify as Hispanic. You'll see in the report that overall, it's now 15%, sorry, 17% of American Jews who tell us that they live in a household where at least one other person, a child or adult, uh, identifies as Black, Hispanic, Asian, some other non-white race, or multiracial. And among Jews under the age of 30, that figure rises to 29% live in a household where at least one person, child or adult, identifies with one of those or more than one of those non-white categories. Next slide, please. 
So just to sum up, um, uh, at one level, as Becca said, there's a lot of stability. Uh, but in some cases, the stability is really surface stability. And just below the surface, a lot of change may be taking place. The population has been stable as a share, uh, roughly stable as a share of the U.S. population, but has grown by our estimates from about 6.7% to about, from sorry, 6.7 million to uh, 7.5 million from 2013 to 2020. In terms of branch identification, uh, it's very similar overall to what it was in 2013, but the share, particularly among younger Jews who are Orthodox, and the share among younger Jews who don't identify with any denomination or who fall into this related but somewhat different category of Jews of no religion uh, is growing. And so, uh, for example, uh, in the 2013 study among Jews under the age of 30 in 2013, about a third were Jews of no religion. In the 2020 study, it's 40%. Intermarriage, no evidence that it's risen since 2013, but pretty clear evidence that it's been rising over the long haul. With that, um, thank you very much. Um, we've touched here on only a few of the things in the survey. There's a great deal more, but I think it's time to move on to Meredith Jacobs and our panel. Uh, I can't wait to hear what they uh, think are some of the implications of this research for Jewish communities and organizations across the country. Becca and Alan, thank you so much. And and by the way, that sh this whole Falda age divide is playing out nightly in my home. Good afternoon. My name is Meredith Jacobs and I am the CEO of Jewish Women International. And it is truly an honor to moderate this conversation. Before we begin, I do want to acknowledge what's happening right now in Israel and to send our thoughts and prayers for safety. You know, just last week, my organization, JWI, released our own needs assessment of Jewish domestic violence survivors and programs. So I know how studies like these are not meant simply as a snapshot of a moment in time, but rather they're meant to serve as a catalyst for initiatives that will respond to the findings and propel our community into the future. As Alan made clear in his opening remarks, it is the researcher's responsibility to provide us with information, but it is our responsibility to take that information and do something with it. So this is the first of many conversations and it is here when we will begin to answer, so what? I'm joined today by a distinguished panel whom I will briefly introduce. Rabbi Elka Abrahamson, president of the Wexner Foundation. Rabbi Abrahamson has been affiliated with the Wexner Leadership Program for 20 years. She's currently the High Holiday Rabbi at the 92nd Street Y in New York City, the recipient of both the Ben Mandelkorn and Bernard Reisman Awards, and recognition of excellence in Jewish leadership. And in fact, Newsweek once named her one of the 50 most influential rabbis in North America. Rabbi Mark Baker is president and CEO of the Combined Jewish Philanthropies of Greater Boston. He spent most of his life in Greater Boston's Jewish community, including as head of school at Gone Academy, Greater Boston's pluralistic Jewish high school. He was one of the first students in Jerusalem's Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies Educators Program, where he was also ordained. Dr. Michal Bitten is scholar in residence at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America and a sociologist of American Jews. Her research focuses on a Sephardic Syrian American community and what it reveals about narratives of American tolerance, assimilation, and liberalism. Dr. Bitten is the co-founder and communal leader of the Downtown Minion and Eric Fingerhut, President and CEO of the Jewish Federations of North America. Prior to his appointment at JFNA, Mr. Fingerhut served as the President of Hillel University. Before focusing his career on the Jewish American community, he led Ohio's systems of public universities and colleges, served as Ohio State Senator, and represented Ohio's 19th Congressional District in the U.S. Congress. 
Following this conversation, we will be joined again by Becca and Alan for our Q&A. I just want to note there are already a tremendous number of questions filling up the chat. So please understand we will try and get to as many as possible and we'll work to really pull threads and themes. Um, and just so you all know, you will be able to access a recording of this as well as the slides that Becca and Alan used uh, if you go on pewresearch.org. So let's begin. Eric, I'm going to start with you. News reports have already started and the headlines run the gamut from Jews are more Orthodox Jews are more secular. Young Jews are detached from Judaism. There are more Jews than ever and they're staying Jewish. We're politically divided and we're increasingly diverse. So let's start with the so what to frame the importance of this conversation. From your perspective as CEO of JFNA, our largest governing body. What do these studies do to shape the next five to 10 years of Jewish life in America for the over 4,000 people listening today? What are they listening for? And how will our organizations and funders react? Well, thanks, Meredith. Uh, I actually think that Alan uh, undersold a little bit uh, the impact of the data from 2013 in his opening remarks. I, I suppose it was a little bit of the modesty of the author. Uh, in fact, I think that the 2013 Pew study as the communal studies, the national community studies that preceded uh, Pew joining this, uh, the, the assuming leadership of this field were enormously impactful. It drove the conversation for months and years um, and, uh, and it drove programmatic decisions and funding decisions. Um, I think that there are at least three reasons why this study released today is likely to be even more impactful uh, on funding and programmatic decisions across the Jewish community than even the 2013 study. Uh, first, there is a significantly a significant increase in sophistication around the use of data. Uh, in the Jewish community since 2013. Funders understand and look for uh, evidence of data and impact and organizations like uh, Jewish federations and all the agencies that we support and serve likewise are increasingly uh, adept at utilizing data and, uh, and designing programming to respond to real challenges, not simply to anecdotal challenges. Secondly, uh, there's been a significant growth of the field of national philanthropy uh, since 2013. There are simply more uh, and more sophisticated funders who are looking to make a broad impact across the entire uh, Jewish community, not just uh, specifically in their hometown or, uh, or in their backyards. And for them, this data is a true goldmine. Uh, and, and finally, and again, I think this was briefly mentioned perhaps by Becca, uh, but I don't think that we can underestimate the post-COVID environment uh, in which this is landing. It may have been designed pre-COVID, as Becca told us, and administered pre-COVID, but it lands now as we come out of COVID. And, and here I think there are, there are several elements of the post-COVID environment. Uh, we are technologically uh, in a different place than we were even a year ago, which means that the speed with which programs are developed and grants are made is accelerating, the conversations are happening. Secondly, we're in a very different collaborative environment among Jewish organizations. We all learned to work together. We had to work together. The competition that, uh, that we've all, all experienced in the past in many ways has given rise, has, has, has given way to a, a real uh, linking of arms and saying, how can we work together? Which means multiple organizations could come together, use this data to uh, design programs and make an impact. Uh, and we're in a yearning for community moment. People have been isolated uh, and alone uh, for over a year. Uh, and they want to come together. So I would say that the post-COVID environment is a, a let's get it done moment. It's not a let's fight about it or let's study it for a year uh, uh, moment. And all of that leads me to think that uh, the, to the over 4,000 people listening, this is an enormously important uh, study and data that we are going to put to use immediately and impactfully and is going to significantly drive the uh, funding and programmatic conversations in the Jewish community for the months to come. 
I agree. I'm, I'm thinking right now of how many organizations wish they had access to these findings before they submitted their proposals for the JCRIF grants. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see to see what happens. Mark, I want to turn to you. There's there's obvious tensions in the findings between Judaism as a religion and Judaism as a culture. You know, those who define Jewishness as a belief in the God of the Bible versus those who express their Judaism as living morally and ethically or fighting for justice. And I get it. There has been a concerted effort since 2013 to engage people in non-traditional ways. And one might point to a sign of success as an increase in the number of people who identify as Jewish. But for you, someone leading a large Jewish community, how do you look at these findings and define community? How do we shift from thinking of divergence into more of one of the beauty of the expansiveness of Jewish expression? Thank you so much for that beautifully phrased question, Meredith. Uh, and thank you to Pew and JFNA for including me today. Uh, and I'm certainly answering that question through the lens of a Jewish communal leader and someone who spent most of my career actually uh, educating the next generation. So I want to make two main points, one uh, about hope and one a more meta point about language, which speaks to many of the things you asked about. Uh, first, the data. Uh, and I think it's important to note this is not a story of doom and gloom when it comes to the American Jewish community. Over the past eight years, we might have thought that inertia alone would suggest that we'd be shrinking or getting weaker. And those elements of stability uh, that Alan and Becca pointed out, the fact that so much has actually stayed the same since 2013, I think should be celebrated as an enormous success. Uh, this is because of the investments we are already making in programs and initiatives and approaches to Jewish life that focus on creativity in addition to continuity and that are expansive and open rather than fearful and closed off. We have the tools and we have the will to inspire people to choose to stay Jewish and to grow Jewish communities. Uh, and I think uh, the stability is a message of possibility and hope. Uh, and the second thing I want to talk about is language. Uh, and I know that the job of a study like this is to describe the reality, but it's also true that language that we use to describe uh, creates. Language creates the frameworks, the mental models in which people live and learn and make sense of their Jewish lives and their world. And how people make sense of their identity affects their identity. Uh, Alan, I'm not a sociologist, and I really appreciate your description of what's unique about Pew and why we have the Jews of no religion category. And I know that when we delve into the data, the nuances come out. But that said, I continue to feel like there is a fundamental problem with a binary conception of Jewish identity by religion or of no religion. First of all, when you think in binaries, you get divergence and polarization, two of the study's significant findings. But, but I want to focus on the fact that binaries also limit people's imagination about what's possible. And they can turn what has always been a broad, dynamic range of Jewish cultural expression into a simplistic dichotomy. So Alan and Becca, I'd love to see us turn the category of Jews of no religion into Jews of diverse expressions of Jewish culture, values, spirituality, and practice who simply might not identify with the narrow American mental model of religion. And I haven't yet figured out the acronym. Uh, now, this may seem like semantics, but I really think, especially the leaders and the educators and the parents who are listening to this, need to examine and break the limiting mental models of what it means to be Jewish in the 21st century. The only way uh, to expand, especially for our next generation, the understanding of what's possible in terms of finding meaning and connection and purpose in Jewish life is if we develop new vocabulary. And by the way, it's not just religious, not religious. We need to break down other unhelpful binaries, such as tradition versus innovation, breadth versus depth, one-time transformational experiences versus lifelong Jewish journeys. The great news is we're already doing this in so many ways that can't be described as religious or not religious. Think arts and culture, think birthright, think repair the world, PJ Library, Moisha House, 
Even Jewish day schools, synagogues, and camps are reimagining themselves to attract people who years ago might never have chosen those institutions. And when we do this, we open up possibilities for people not to have to make a choice between religious or not religious, but rather to find their ways in, to chart their own paths, and ultimately to co-create new models of positive, affirmative, different but equally serious and compelling expressions of Jewish tradition, culture, belief, and practice. That's how we move from a limiting binary to a vibrant continuum, and that's how we're going to deepen and grow all expressions of American Jewish life, and that's what gives me hope for our future. I think that's beautiful. Thank you so much for that, because I think it is um, to read the report, you can come away with that doom and gloom. So um, your framework is very helpful. And, and I think it's important what you said about how language and naming can either call people in or, or push people away, which, which leads me to my next question from Michal. You've written about um, and studied racial and ethnic diversity of Jews. And, and of course, this has been a large focus of communal work, especially this past year following the murder of George Floyd, where we've not only had a widespread awakening in America, but as a Jewish community have re really looked within at the lack of racial parity and equity and how organizations are working to create spaces of belonging. But you've cautioned not to lump every Jew who is not white or Ashkenazi into a Jew of color umbrella that that actually flattens the differences between Jewish populations. So can you speak to this? How can our communities internalize these findings and be more inclusive? Uh, sure, thanks, Meredith. Uh, let me start before answering your question, just saying how important uh, it is for our communities that we are investing right now really seriously in the work of racial justice, both more broadly in America and also really working on raising up the profile and voices and narratives of Jews who look differently than each other and who have really different backgrounds in our communities. And this is urgently significant work. And as with all important work, it is not easy work. <laughs> and it's work that demands a lot of energy and investment and dedication and dialogue and work with each other. I also want to say, and I'll speak for a second, not as a sociologist, not as a scholar, nor as a leader, but I'll just speak personally as someone who very happily and proudly belongs to um, the American Jewish community, who's worked within the establishment uh, in the American Jewish community, uh, and, and, and on all the interactions that I had with people who say, Jewish, and sometimes they only mean a certain kind of Jew uh, when they say Jewish. So I want to affirm, and I want to just for a second name some of the layers of diversity that Pew really raised. It happens to be that, uh, you know, they, they describe me in different ways, but I'll just name them. 8% um, of people in our community are not white and or are Hispanic. 7% um, of American Jews, of those who make up our community, identify with Sephardic or Mizrahi custom in some way, which is really important. 10% of our communities are um, immigrants, which adds a whole new layer of people who speak English as a second, third, fourth, or whatever language, who have accents, uh, and who've come to this country who, um, to, to join and really build our, our community. So all these things are incredibly significant to raise the visibility and make people make us, make all of us feel like we are seen, like we matter and like we belong. As we do this work, I do wanna offer three recommendations or three ideas to all those of us who wanna center this uh, in our communities. The first one is to see some of this data um, as the beginning of the work. None of this should be the end of the conversation. It's the beginning of the work. I am eager, excited to have a robust, research activists and communal agenda for all of us in our different ecosystems and they might look very differently from each other to ask ourselves what can we do in our specific spaces to raise up the diverse voices of all of these different jews who come um you know who, who represent many different uh, voices many different backgrounds so that's the first thing this is the beginning of a really important work uh, and and not just the beginning there's been a lot of really important work that that's led us to this moment but we should just do more of this uh, the second thing that I want to emphasize, and Meredith, this, this, this goes to your question, is I do think that it's really significant that as we do work of focusing on the 
di diversity uh, inside our Jewish communities, that we don't flatten that diversity, that we understand there's diversity within diversity. It's not only about naming the quote unquote mainstream and then putting everybody else in a different category. Uh, we have to really be sensitive to different expressions of Jewishness. Uh, for example, you know, I, I have family members who are white and Sephardic and, and friends who are Ashkenazi and black Jews. And all of these categories come up in all different ways. And the fact that there's different viewpoints, different politics, different backgrounds, different narratives. Mark, going back to what you said, some of us who want to continue having traditionalist categories, others who want to have new acronyms, um, Jews of color, immigrant Jews, all kinds of populations that we need to be really sensitive to uh, in order to include them. And the last thing that I will say is the following. I'm sure that there will be some debate and some disagreement and some robust discussion around these findings and other findings. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Whenever you have a real field, whenever you have like a robust ecosystem of research, of ideas, of activism, that's really good. The fact that we have many voices there really comprising the field. But I do want to urge all of us, not only when it comes to the racial and ethnic diversity of Jews, but in general, uh, to remember that behind every single data point and percentage, uh, percentage points, there are people. There are individuals in our communities who want to feel seen, who want to feel included, and we want to feel like, like we matter. And I hope we can keep this in mind as we continue having these conversations. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you started in such a personal way. And, and, and you write in your, in your research, cautioning us not to make assumptions and stereotypes on what we think different communities, how they'll connect, identify politically, or their expressions of their Judaism and that caution against building in more stereotypes and assumptions um, on groups rather than focusing on individuals, I think is very important. Um, and, and Elka, that kind of leads to what I wanted to talk to you about. The report really points to a, a broadening polarization in our community, our, our politics, our affiliations with various denominations, expressions of our Judaism, and it's no surprise given what's happening more broadly in our world and, and actually the, the systems that are in place, I would just name social media for one, that work to drive us all even further apart. Um, your work at the Wexner Foundation um, has with success focused in pension support on leadership across divides. And yet here we are with data telling us we are farther apart than we were four years ago. So as someone who trains our organizational lay leadership, what roles does leadership play in bridging these growing divides? Thank you, Meredith. Uh, my teacher, Larry Hoffman, reminds me that the question of our day is not whether people are Jews, but when, how, and under what conditions they embrace their Judaism. Because most people, as Mark mentioned, are many things in this era of multiple identities. And if this is true, the Jewish communal ecosystem must evolve in order to accommodate Jews, however they self-define, in a variety of stages and phases of identity and connection. But if we are going to define ourselves as one people, today is a wake-up call to regard our growing divisions as opportunities for uncovering what unites and divides us. Divisiveness grows hotter across a series of dizzying divides. Universalist versus particularist, the political right and left, liberal versus orthodox, Israel, anti-Semitism, what is it? And who is most responsible for it? These differences have evolved from caustic to toxic. And I praise those many of you out there, I know are among them, who are advancing models for speaking across those widening divides, keep at it. And I want to surface one more additional divide, the widening gap between those who can afford the very best of what we offer, like Jewish preschools and day schools and summer camps, shul memberships and homes within a walking distance to those shuls, and those who cannot afford it. We must develop enduring rather than episodic strat strategies to fund Jewish learning for a lifetime, lest our day schools become elite private schools and our summer camps havens only for privileged kids. Like the others on this panel, and like you, Meredith, I'm optimistic 
that at this crossroads between COVID and what could be, and I make this plea, let us resist snapping back to comfortable habits and continue on a faster paced journey to a yet to be formed vision of the Jewish future. I believe in the core philosophy of the foundation that I lead, that one, leaders matter, two, leadership is fundamentally about change, and three, change involves loss, which makes exercising transformational leadership very complex. We must develop change leaders if we're serious about growing from strength to stronger. That includes reducing the staggering costs of graduate educations for those who will steward our Jewish organizations into the future. Younger Jewish leaders may question the significance of the Pew study itself, believing it will overly influence the Jewish philanthropic agenda or would assert Pew is asking the wrong questions. My work includes coming to know many of our emerging Jewish leaders. They are courageous and eager to take on the future, and they're full of questions for us. They challenge many of the tightly guarded assumptions we have about Jewish life, identity, family, and Jewish belonging. We need to be relentlessly curious, not just about the data, but about, as Michal said, about individuals about the lived experience of people we might not understand. We have to replace outrage with curiosity. And yes, our rising leaders should do the same and hear the perspective and wisdom of experienced leaders too. There's a tense divide. None of this is new, but as the study indicates, our internal tribalism is rising to unhealthy levels. I lead an organization committed to pluralism, where diversity is a core value. Jewish leaders engage face-to-face -face with Jews who were once the other. After 35 years of success, we're just getting started. If we are serious about fashioning remarkable organizations built for tomorrow, we need to invest deeply in an outstanding workforce and provide access to cutting-edge leadership training. We must insist, demand, healthy, equitable, safe, and diverse workplaces. I'm not describing tweaks or a few new programs. Instead, I am urging our movements and all training institutions to radically, and I use that word intentionally, reconsider recruitment, curriculum, collaborative partnerships, and extended mentoring for a large cadre of change leaders, including pooling funds and co-locating to bring students together at the root of their training for world-class understanding of leadership and to really respect different expressions of Jewish life. They can then model civil discourse. I am confident this will empower our leaders to move the needle on the troubling data point that only one in five U.S. Jews say their religious faith is highly meaningful. We need leaders who understand that meaning making requires translating Jewish ideas into many and newly imagined forms. Leaders who are not threatened by diversity because they are in relationship with those with whom they disagree. Bold leaders who comfortably integrate Torah and transformational leadership seamlessly. This is a project and not fix. The data today compared with the numbers from eight years ago, reveals that keeping things as they are, even if, as Mark said, even if stable, translates to keeping things as they are. And that is a pattern we can break for the better if we get really serious about change. Extraordinary, extraordinary leaders can drive that. Amen to all of that, to providing access to transformational leadership and to moving forward and not backwards. Eric, I'm gonna um, send our final moderated question to you before we begin the Q&A. And I think it's perfect as a former member of Congress. Um, our increasingly political polarization leads directly to the next key finding, which is concern about anti-Semitism and hate, which again was not on the radar in the 2013 study. Um, I'm going to point to the researchers' findings and the connection between political and religious divides and how we're even 
thinking and talking about anti-Semitism and hate, how politics invade the discourse around sources of anti-Semitism. So JFNA has led initiatives to ensure safety, but what more can we can be done? How can we together as a community address anti-Semitism and hate? Yeah, uh, Meredith, thank you so much. It's such an important topic. And uh, before I address the issue of polarization, which which indeed is present in the study and is worrisome in the subject of anti-Semitism, uh, let's just start with something Alan briefly mentioned, but. Uh, but it needs to be underscored. The reason why the public feels that anti-Semitism and their safety uh, is a problem today that as opposed to 2013 is because we have just experienced the most violent period uh, in likely the entire history uh, of the Jewish community in, uh, in North America, from Pittsburgh to Poway to Jersey City to Muncie to uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and then, of course, anti-Semitism visibly in Charlottesville, as Alan mentioned, and at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, uh, and, and, and all the online uh, hate that we've seen. And as the former head of Hillel, uh, I have to say, and on campus experienced by, uh, by our college students. So the, 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 the respondents to the Pew study are simply reflecting reality. If, we, if, the, uh, if it were otherwise, we would question uh, what, uh, you know, what it is uh, that uh, that we're experiencing, uh, and uh, the fact that the plurality, as evidenced by the, the study, says that despite their fears, they continue to move forward uh, in participating in Jewish life, uh, is a reflection of the massive investments that we've been making uh, in uh, in safety and security. There's now 45 Jewish federations out of 146 that have community security initiatives with professional community security directors helping train and, and facilitate all of the, the uh, schools and synagogues in their communities, uh, probably spending in the range of $30 million across all of our communities. That doesn't count the budgets of every school and JCC and, uh, and camp. Um, and uh, we're in an effort to extend that uh, more broadly across uh, the entire umbrella in a project we call Live Secure. We have the Secure Communities Network, which is helping coordinate excellence across the system. And, and we've lobbied the federal government, which is now uh, has a program for the, we call the Nonprofit Security Grant Program that has reached $180 million this year, double of what it was the previous year to pay for the physical security of, uh, of, of nonprofit institutions. So, so this is real um, and, uh, and we need to make sure that we don't uh, that we don't allow the political polarization, which I'll address briefly now, to distract us from the work, which uh, I can assure the audience of the Jewish federations will not allow, will not be distracted uh, from from this work. But but a word about political polarization. So Meredith, you asked the question beautifully. I'm a former politician. Uh, I was a, a you know a state official, a state legislator, and a uh, and, and and a member of the U.S. Congress, and ran for ran for offices that I lost as well. Um, and so it's just important to reflect that the that the role of uh, political partisans uh, is uh, is to use the public debate to propel their side into power. I had a colleague in, uh, when I was in the state uh, the state senate in Ohio who used to say the role of the minority is to become the majority, um, and so that is uh, the role. And the fact that 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 seeps into the uh, debate about anti-Semitism and how and that people tend to see it through their uh, political lens uh, is disturbing, but not also ultimately surprising. But the role of Jewish communal organizations, of which federations are a cornerstone, uh, is quite different. It is our job to build the broadest possible areas of consensus across the community. Uh, it is our job to ensure to the best we can that the disagreements that remain among us are channeled into appropriate ways of expressing disagreement like elections and like government. It's important to remember there's, oh, there have been Jews who have been prominent leaders in both political parties forever uh, and in every administration, Republican uh, and Democratic. We are very capable of expressing the areas of difference uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, political uh, and governmental process. And then it's our job to make it, frankly, more attractive for all of the pieces, parts of our communities to participate in the communal system uh, than uh, to discard the communal system and, uh, and seek to, uh, to undermine it. These are goals that we 
uh, that we embrace. And frankly, we know they're harder today. Anybody uh, you know, who's honest knows that it's harder today to do so when we've just come through this dramatic era, era of political polarization. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Meredith, in your question to, uh, to, to Rabbi Abramson, the social media, that you know, the disintegration of any sort of common communication uh, platforms uh, has, has added to that. Uh, I, I also have to say uh, that, look, it is human nature for us to see the anti-Semitism on the other side that we don't agree with uh, than it is to see it on our own side, or perhaps we're more tempted to rationalize it or explain it away uh, uh, in uh, in our own side. There's also human differences. Some, some believe that you that want to take a more confrontational approach to incidents of, of anti-Semitism. Others believe more in education uh, and engagement. These are different parts of our, you know, our left and right uh, uh, brains. Frankly, if we're honest, both sides can claim some victories and have suffered, uh, have suffered some defeats uh, in their approach. So I would say that the bottom line for me as the you know, as the president and CEO, privileged to be the leader of the Jewish Federation system, but also privileged to work in partnership with so many wonderful Jewish communal organizations um, uh, that uh, that we just have to uh, double, redouble, triple uh, our efforts at community consensus building. I actually would argue we're probably doing better uh, than uh, than we either think we are or that we're getting credit for because the community is held together. Uh, really quite well through what is, as I pointed out, has been a very violent time and a very uh, t politically toxic time, as others have pointed out. Uh, but we must do that. Uh, and I assure you that uh, that we will do that. Thank you so much. We're going to turn now to our Q&A. We're running a scooch long. I hope those of you listening will stay with us a little bit longer and again, continue to um, put your questions into the chat. We're going to be joined again by Alan Cooperman and Becca Alper. And the first questions are directed to the two of you as our research team. Um, folks are wondering how um, uh, participants were identified and also were there any um, people who are not Jewish but who are very active members of the Jewish community considered as part of this research in any way? Well, I'll take the first part of that and then I'll let uh, Alan expand on the second part. Um, so we identified people to participate in our survey the way, same way we do with all of our surveys. Uh, we asked people, what is your present religion, if any? Um, then we included two additional questions. Uh, asking people, uh, aside from religion, do you consider yourself to be Jewish in any way? For example, ethnically, culturally, or because of your family background? And then we asked whether respondents were raised Jewish or had a Jewish parent. Those who told us that they were Jewish in the first question or answered yes to either of the other two questions were included in our survey. So that's how we identified people. And then analytically, we, we've mostly focused on those two groups that Alan and I talked about already, Jews by religion and Jews of no religion. Thank you. No, yeah, I'll, oh, Alan. I'll just jump into the second part of the question and say, yes, uh, certainly. Um, we have people uh, who received the, the survey questions because they told us that they consider themselves Jewish in some way. And that could be because they have a Jewish member of their family. Maybe they're not Jewish themselves, but but they're married to someone who's Jewish, or maybe their mother or father remarried and married someone who's Jewish, or maybe their child married someone who's Jewish, or all, all different kinds of ways. And those people are included in, in the study. Uh, to be clear though, um, for analytical purposes, if someone told us that their religion is something other than Judaism, uh, they told us that they're Christians, uh, then they did get the questions, but we're not counting them as Jewish in the, in the survey results. Uh, ultimately, other researchers could go back into the data set and decide to, 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 uh, to change that decision. But, um, but in our kind of decision rules, uh, if you have some other religion, you can't be Jewish, but you can be in the survey. And there's a whole chapter in the survey about two groups, actually. Uh, one is people of Jewish background, people who were raised Jewish, or had a Jewish parent, but now have a different religion. And, and they also got many of the survey questions, and so we have data on them. And then there's what we call a Jewish affinity group, and that would include many people uh, like the one that, 
that the listener or viewer was probably um, interested in. Uh, people who have an, a relationship to Jewishness that's not maybe personal, that is, they don't personally consider themselves Jewish or they don't have a Jewish parent, but somebody else close to them does. And uh, so they have a Jewish affinity and they're also in that category and they are included in the survey and we have a lot of data on them. And in fact, in that Jewish affinity group, just for, for example, uh, there are quite strong attachments to Israel that are voiced by many people in that affinity group, um, as there are, by the way, in uh, many people of Jewish background as well. That's interesting how the affinity group allows us to expand Again, that sense of belonging in the Jewish community. One more question for the two of you. Um, someone asked why you chose to just use male and female as the gender options. So, um there was this, this binary option. And we did so because that's that's the way we had done it, and we knew it worked with. You know, we use this is a question we use to to weigh our data. Um, but then in the summer of 2020, we did an experiment as a center to figure out more ways, a different way to ask this question to be more inclusive. And the results of that showed us that we we can ask this a different way, and that's something that we do now. But unfortunately, the results of that happened after we, we were done with the survey, so we couldn't implement it yet. Interesting. The next is- Yeah, I'll just quickly all say, oh, go ahead. something like that. You can't make a change like that quickly because it's so important for the weighting of the survey. So we have to experiment with it and be sure that it will work methodologically before we do it. It might seem to be, five years ago or more already the right thing to do in terms of understanding our society. But methodologically, we have to make our data line up with census data and be able to weight it. Uh, so it took us, uh, I will apologize. Uh, we, myself, our colleagues, Becca, we all wanted to ask about gender in a non-binary way. It just took us a little while to get there as a center and unfortunately, uh, took place too late for this study, but future Pew Research Center studies will ask about gender in a non-binary way, as, as Becca said. Interesting, so we'll see that in uh, the 2027 study that I'm guessing will be out. <laughs> okay, question for all of you. What are the implications for synagogue memberships if Jews are less likely to identify with religion and a belief in God? and more in associating with friends and families and kind of that DIY Judaism. Judaism. Looking at well, I'll, rabbis. I'll, 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 oh, Alka, go ahead. I'll bite, I'll bite uh, both as a, in my role at the foundation as a former um, congregational rabbi, I would just say on one foot, synagogues have to be much more expansive in how they think of themselves institutionally and to, uh, ways recreate themselves to work together on different kinds of uh, opportunities for entry. And uh, going back to my colleague Mark's uh, comments to to not be so quick to see themselves as in a narrow way. And I'm going to ask Mark to comment on that as well. You know, what would it mean to be a different looking synagogue and to have, and I'll go back to leadership, leaders who just have a broader understanding of what their institution can be and how you partner, by the way, with other institutions in the community, which is an opportunity that arrogance, we have to get serious about sustained, meaningful collaboration and, and co-location of activities. So it's not, we're not in these lanes of service for our, I, don't, I mean, service, small s, not religious service for our communities. Mark, did you want to? Add to that. Uh, yeah, let me just quickly say, so many synagogues are already doing this. I think it's really important that we don't work with an outdated mental model of synagogues as simply these institutions struggling with membership, because that's just not true. There are synagogues that are struggling with membership, and there are other synagogues that are reimagining themselves into truly like a Beit Knesset which doesn't mean house of prayer, it means house of gathering, and I would argue kind of almost a cultural, spiritual 
uh, moral center um, of Jewish life. And I think that's the direction that the synagogues that are going to thrive are going to go. And I think notions of membership also is something that you're either a member or not member is already becoming more fluid. Um, and we're going to see different ways and different entry points and ways for people to express their desire uh, to connect with, with communities and with Jewish life. Uh, and that would be great. Can I add something? Yeah, absolutely, Michal. Uh, I'll add something. Uh, I, I lead a I lead a, a community for for young folks uh, in Lower Manhattan, uh, and we did do away with membership. I call it like the Sephardic model of getting together, even though most folks are Ashkenazi. But I would say that there's uh, we spoke about diversity uh, in Jewish life, and there's still a lot of. Uh, Jews of all ages who who want to be in traditional spaces and with traditional liturgy, um, and and we have all kinds of synagogues that are imagining imagining themselves and what they're giving to people in different ways. So I guess I'm just naming the fact that there's a lot of uh, I hear a lot of excitement around uh, you know do it yourself Judaism and reimagining things and changing everything, which I think is really significant. And there's going to be different populations and different communities who are going to crave it. But also when we talk about the Jewish people and different findings and trying to be pluralistic and diverse about all of the different packets in our community, we are going to have different models of what a flourishing synagogue or community center looks like, some of them more traditional, some of them less traditional. And we need to continue having an expanded understanding about what flourishing Jewish life looks like. Mm. That's right. It's interesting what you were saying about membership also. It's something that um, we're talking about at JWI, how membership almost gives a sense of a transactional relationship. What am I getting for my membership as opposed to really a sense of community and belonging? Um, something else you all spoke to was what are the changes that have happened during the pandemic? that have reimagined synagogue life. Um, and so that was one of the questions also, and I'm, of course we don't all have that crystal ball, but if we were to take this study, the survey now, how do you think it would have been, the answers would have changed because of COVID and because of the pandemic and what we've all lived through these past months? No one has a crystal ball. <laughs> It'll be well, interesting. I'm, 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 Go ahead. I'm happy okay. to jump in uh, since no one else is. Uh, one is that I, I do think that there's been tremendous appreciation for leadership. I think people have a whole new sense of how creative their rabbis are and their educators and their Jewish communal leaders. I think the legacy institutions like federations have really been first responders in this moment and stepped into leadership in a way that we might not have appreciated until the pandemic. And I, I think that's amazing. I think what people have been able to experience across the space of Jewish life has been astounding. Many of us have been to educational experiences. I think of, uh, how many folks have come into uh, Hartman classes in a way that they hadn't before. I think someone mentioned how many more people are experiencing online learning. There's There's been really an explosion of opportunity. What we do with that, I think is a big question. And I think that's the next conversation that our leaders and our lay leaders and our congregations members are having. And I think there's some really interesting ground up work that's going to happen. And by the way, I wanna say, I think we need both local, communities in person and you know the digital amazing experiences we can have like we are now it's not either or none of this is either or we're in a fantastic both and moment and we shouldn't lose that right that so, hybrid uh, revolution alan uh, or, or, or eric i think i heard you first and then alan Yes, just very quickly to emphasize Elka's point, you, you asked the question about synagogues and I don't feel, ex I didn't feel expert there to jump in, but as, as Elka broadened the, the response to include Jewish communal uh, life overall, not only do I endorse the, the extraordinary leadership that I saw from my colleagues across 146 communities, we also convened what we call the Pandemic Emergency Coalition, the leaders of the 
uh, of the major national systems, the U, the JCC Association and Hillel's and uh, Hillel International and and the Prisma for the day schools and Moshe House and the youth groups and all four synagogue movements. We meet weekly, weekly, <laughs> thanks to Zoom to make sure that we're on top of the developments. And then through these networks, we're able to get you know information out almost instantaneously to every corner of of the Jewish community as shown by how we mobilize behind public programs and private fundraising initiatives, so human services, just extraordinary. So I don't think that, that uh, I mentioned it, but you cannot underscore how this, this moment plus the technology uh, combined to create a, uh, a new conversation, a new integrated uh, collaborative leadership uh, a model that I really believe is is going to drive significant change. I, if if the world looks the same seven years from now as it did, you know, as, as it did back in 2013, uh, as we heard so much of the report today, I'll, I'll be very, very surprised. Alan, did you want to? Yes. One of the areas in which we asked a lot more questions in 2020 than in 2013 was uh, uh, the topic I guess I would broadly call economic fragility. Questions about whether people have had difficulty paying various kinds of bills, um, uh, explore, a deeper exploration, if you will, of pockets of poverty within um, a U.S. Jewish population that on the whole, to be sure, um, is, uh, is, is relatively well off, um, has higher rates of education and higher levels of earning on average than the, than the general population of the United States, but that still have, holds within it some quite significant um, pockets, I guess, maybe that's not the right word, but um, let's not blind our eyes to the fact that there are um, uh, Jews who have, who were suffering economically before the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm a little uh, reluctant to get into those numbers because the, if anything, presumably they've gotten worse. Um, these numbers should be looked at as kind of status quo pre-pandemic. But when people look at the report, I hope that they will pay attention to that. And um, I'm not sure because of geographic gradations that we can pinpoint exactly physical pockets, uh, but there are ways of looking at it's it's mostly either people who are much on at the el older end of the spectrum or younger end of the spectrum. It's as in America, poverty is to some extent um, well, is disproportionately concentrated both among the elderly and among the young. And, and that's true in the Jewish population as well. Yeah, and I think it's an important point to make also when we talk about um, all the wonderful things that have happened during this time because of tech, is that with poverty comes that tech divide and that lack of access. And for those who really um, in the Jewish community have experienced this past year, very isolated. Um, I have one final question for, for Becca and Alan, and it's kind of a doozy. Um, I'm just gonna read it verbatim. Why do the results of this survey of fewer than 6,000 Jews matter? How are these opinions representative of all Jewish Americans? Becca, do you wanna tackle that? Do you want me to tackle <laughs> You can start. <laughs> well, you know, um, 6,000 is a small number and yet it's a huge number. Uh, so maybe it wasn't clear to the, to the, to some viewers is that this doesn't, this survey doesn't start out with lists of synagogue members or people with Jewish last names. What we actually did was a massive survey of the general U.S. population. We randomly sent letters to uh, thousands and thousands of addresses across the, the country. And then we asked people who received those to fill out a short screening interview, either on paper with pencil and paper and mail it back to us in an envelope or to go online and do it. So we interviewed 68,000 Americans. And of those 68,000, um, a, a much smaller quantity are defined by our decision rules as Jewish in one way or another. And those those rules about who's Jewish, again, actually is quite, uh, to use word, Mark's, uh, Mark Jacobs' terms, quite a vibrant continuum. It's not 
simply that people who are uh, Jewish by religion or uh, who are highly observant, it captures, it captures an entire spectrum of Jews. And that group is um, statistically uh, representative. They, they're drawn from a random sample, again, of people across the country. And then we make sure um, through weighting, which we've referred to a, a few times, that the, both the broad sample, the 68,000, and the Jewish sample are representative by age, gender, education, uh, and, and uh, region of the country, and a lot of other variables that they're representative. The 68,000 representative of the whole population of the United States and the Jewish population representative of the Jewish population. Now, of course, if you don't believe in statistics, then you're among the 17% of people who don't believe in surveys, so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I want to thank you all. You know, unlike 2013, this research is being released at a moment of inflection. We're moving through a global pandemic. And if we're lucky, we'll use this moment to drive disruption and innovation. Already major Jewish foundations have come together to offer grants to encourage us to collaborate and imagine the possibilities of our Jewish future. At the same time, we are grappling with systemic racial inequity and working not only to create belonging, but to lift diverse voices to leadership. We have this Pew study that offers a landscape of Jewish Americans in 2020, but we also have JWI's assessment of the needs of Jewish survivors of domestic violence. And yesterday, Bivracha released a survey of Jewish communal professionals describing toxic workplaces. So how do we take in this moment? How do we use these studies and this research and this information how do we work collaboratively and positively in a way that proves we have not only heard these voices, but we have listened? How do we use this not as our so what, but as our why? So I wanna thank all of our speakers today, Becca and Alan, Michal and Eric, to Pew Research, to JFNA, to all of you listening who carved out space for one more Zoom, Thank you. And I encourage you all to go to pewresearch.org for the full study and the digital interactive, and to please visit jewishtogether.org for information about additional virtual events. I wish you all Chag Sameach Shavuot, and I look forward to the conversations and work to come. Thank you. <laughs>